Ahoy hoy, I'm Planner Walk, and welcome back to episode 2 of Pseudoscience Papers. And today's paper, it's just amazing. Like the last paper, it is from the General Science Journal. And as we all know, the General Science Journal is just excellent when it comes to papers. So the paper that we're going to be looking at today is a paper titled Disproof of Gravity by Aaron Gorami. And I probably butchered the pronunciation of that, but this paper butchers science, so I think we're even. So let's start with what is kind of an abstract. It's just the first part of the paper and it isn't even labelled abstract, but I'm going to call it an abstract anyway because that's kind of what it is. The standard particle model has yet to find any evidence of gravity. This is most concerning since gravity is used by most modern equations. Great particle accelerators have hunted for any signs of gravity, none found. So there's no evidence of gravity? Well, what is this then? Is that not gravity? Or do they mean that there's no evidence of curved space-time? Because we do have evidence that space-time could be a cause of gravity, especially when it comes to GPS and gravitational waves. Now the next thing that I would do is I would go through the references. However, this paper has no references whatsoever. I'm not even joking, when we just scroll through the paper, there doesn't seem to be any references. There is one citation right here, but that's it. So already it is off to a terrible start, but let's go through it. There are several ways to disprove gravity. One, experimentally. One simple experiment shows there is no gravity. The helium balloon. It rises. How is this possible? Classical mechanics shows that force equals the constant of gravity multiplied by the mass of object 1 multiplied by the mass of object 2 divided by the distance between the masses raised to the second power. With this logic, the mass of the Earth is so great that the helium balloon would have no choice but to be attracted to the Earth. We have mass 1 pulling on mass 2, and mass 2 pulling on mass 1. F1 equals F2. This is just wrong. The force of the balloon that pulls on the Earth is not equal to the force of the Earth that pulls on the balloon. It would not rise. What we see in the experiment that the helium is rising to meet its level of density. So firstly, I have no idea what happened to grammar in that last sentence. Seems like a word was forgotten there. The second thing, of course, is this really does sound like it was written by a flat earther. Because this is the exact type of logic that flat earthers try to use. They say, if gravity is real, then how come helium balloons float? And the answer, of course, is that there's a force opposing gravity. If a force pushing something upwards is greater than the force pushing it downwards, then the net force is going to result in it getting pushed upwards, not downwards. Just because you can counteract a force doesn't mean that that force doesn't exist, as much as flat earthers would like to argue the opposite. 2. Commutative. The mathematics of gravity is a concept called zero-point mass. This is a mass without a volume. This is not found in the universe. The main problem here is the reduction of three-dimensional densities to zero-dimensional masses. Once a density is reduced to a mass, the mass cannot be returned to the original shape of the density. So we cannot cube a zero and get anything but another zero. This breaks the commutative properties of addition. Let's look at some of the equations and how gravity fails at a fundamental level. F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. We have a zero-dimensional mass times a two-dimensional vector, and that does not equal a three-dimensional field. So the main axiom of gravity fails the commutative test. This alone should disprove gravity. Alright, so we've gone from fluorophism to something that sounds like what Bill Gady would say. So I do keep on hearing about this thing called zero-point mass. However, whenever I Google it, I do not get any results for zero-point mass. I keep on getting things for zero-point energy, but not zero-point mass. As I've said before, this whole thing of zero-point mass where you don't consider the volume of an object is a simple way to simplify the maths. Because if you just want to calculate the orbit of, let's say, a space station, then you can treat the Earth as a point and the space station as a point as well. And the maths would effectively work out the same as if you were to consider every single atom on Earth and every single atom of the space station. Now that's not to say that there aren't times when you may want to consider gravity as more than just a point. When calculating something like tidal locking, for example, you'll have to use more than just a point to figure that out. But for most of the time, treating objects as a point, the maths works out fine. Then the paper goes on to say about a zero-dimensional mass times a two-dimensional vector. And wouldn't it be a three-dimensional vector? 
Force is a three-dimensional vector, right? Or am I just missing something? Then it goes on to say that it does not equal a three-dimensional field. But I'm pretty sure that you can get a three-dimensional field if you use Einstein's field equations. Force equals the constant of gravity times the zero-dimensional mass one times the zero-dimensional mass two divided by the three-dimensional length between them squared. So every object pulls every other object. The dimensional problem occurs again. A constant is what is used to fill in the gaps. When things do not work the way we want them to, we just add a constant to fix the problem. When the equation no longer works, we change the constant's value. So the first part of that looks like it's saying that because you have zero dimensional things, you cannot apply anything that's three dimensional to them, which is just not true. For example, a point can have a velocity and a velocity is a three dimensional vector. So yeah, you can mix zero dimensional things with three dimensional things. The next thing says a constant is what is used to fill in the gaps. Not really, a constant is something that is fixed. If you have a constant, then it's something that always remains the same, it does not change. Unless the constant is found out to be wrong, in which case then you will have to change the constant. Physicists know about this problem. They created gravity waves and shell modeling to compensate for the dimensionless mass. But gravity is still dimensionless. The dimensionless mass cannot create a three-dimensional shape. We all know that gravity collapses under the scrutiny of the tiny. Quantum level objects do not show any signs of gravity. The particle accelerators prove this. They have yet to find any force that works as gravity is described. So gravity waves weren't just created. They were predicted by relativity and then measured at LIGO, which is just more evidence for gravity when you really think about it. When it comes to the quantum level objects not showing any signs of gravity, that is because gravity is really weak. It is already really difficult to detect things on a tiny scale. Trying to detect really weak interactions on a tiny scale is even harder. Now that's not to say that gravity doesn't affect things on a small level. It does. It's just that it's generally from really big things like the Earth. 3. Gravity fails the multi-body test. Gravity can only compute the force between two objects. Any equation that uses a sum of objects fails in this way. First the two objects force is computed, then the third body is computed with the resultant of the first two bodies. Then that resultant force is computed with the fourth body. That is how summation works. The problem is that the distance between object 1 and 2 is not evaluated in the next iteration. So what it sounds like they're saying here is, let's say that you have three objects and you wanted to calculate the gravitational pull that one of those objects experiences. So first you'd calculate the gravitational pull between object 1 and 2. Then you'd calculate the gravitational pull between object 1 and 3. And you'd add the two results that you got together. The problem with that seems to be that when you calculate the gravitational pull between object 1 and 3, you're not considering the distance between object 1 and 2. And the reason why this is not a problem is because you have done those calculations already, you don't need to do them again. And it is perfectly fine to add results together like that, I do not see the problem there. I'm not even sure how you would even include the distance between object 1 and 2 in the calculations for the force between object 1 and 3. Now one thing the paper fails to consider is that you could calculate the centre of mass in a system and then calculate the gravitational pull towards that centre of mass. For example, Earth technically doesn't orbit the Sun. It orbits Barry, I mean the Barry Centre. I've probably just disappointed someone called Barry who would have loved for the Earth to orbit them. I'm sorry Barry. 4. Gravity and complex systems. Let's look at a hurricane that is travelling over the ocean. The spinning winds cause rotation in the ocean. The low pressure of the storm causes a bulge upwards in the ocean. Heat and pressure are two of the main variables in the system. As the temp increases, it decreases the pressure of the storm, causing an increase in the intensity in the storm. The heated air is forced up the eye wall. This is an example of a temperature slash pressure force on density. It is not possible for gravity to describe this system, with or without spheres. So obviously gravity cannot describe the entire thing. You would be ludicrous to think that it could. That being said, gravity can help explain certain aspects of the system. That is because gravity will always be acting on the matter within the system. So gravity will have some effect on it. So the next section, section 5, is the longest section and it is also quite nonsensical and because of that I'm not going to read out the entire thing. 
But there are some golden parts which I just have to address. So for context, this section is titled Questions Posed by Others. No capital, the rainfall because of gravity. Rain falls because as cold water it is more dense or less buoyant than the surrounding air. So obviously this is your standard flurf talking point. Things fall because of buoyancy and density. What they don't seem to realise is that you do need gravity because, you know, G is part of the buoyant force, so you can't get around that. This ascending motion is also affected by the Coriolis force. Spares full stop. There are only four forces. Gluon, nuclear, W boson, magnetism, Z boson, electricity, and the photon, heat. Those are the only forces that have been experimentally shown. Uh, what? Heat is a force now? I... I just have no words for how wrong everything there is. Like, everything there is just wrong. None of that is how it works at all. That singular line in the paper just completely halved my IQ by having to read it. The term T in the Navier-Stokes equation above hides a lot of complexities that often still need to be understood. Like G, they change T frequently. These changes of G try to mimic the evidence. Just change the constant and you'll get what you want to see. So firstly, the paper does not actually contain any Navier-Stokes equation at all. Secondly, I searched for the Navier-Stokes equation and could not find one that had a T that didn't mean time. So maybe if you're going to reference something, it would be a good idea to, you know, actually include it in the paper so that everyone can go, ah oh, yes, that's what they mean. They also say that G is changed all the time. And the only time that they really change G is when a more accurate measurement of G comes along. Because surprise surprise, whenever we take a measurement, there will always be a slight margin of error. As for part 6, that is called silly paradoxes created by gravity, and it doesn't really go into detail, it just lists a whole lot of things like wormholes, parallel universes, flat universe, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't actually explain why any of these things are paradoxes, it just says that they're a paradox without any further explanation. Kepler's three laws are more in line with how the planets orbit the Sun. This is because of the Sun's motion around the galaxy. This causes the elliptical shape of the orbit, not gravity. Gravity cannot explain three-body interactions. If the equation has a G in it, then it is a zero-point mass system, and that does not exist in the universe. Well, buoyancy has a G in it, so therefore buoyancy doesn't exist, right? And also, Kepler's laws do work, but to an extent, there are certain things that Kepler's laws just cannot work for. Kepler's laws just do not work when it comes to unstable orbits. Like when the Earth gains another moon, that moon does not have a stable orbit around the Earth. Kepler's laws cannot describe gravity assists, because Kepler's laws explicitly deal with orbits. So whilst Kepler's laws can be useful for certain things, sometimes you do have to use gravity. The rules of the universe are simple. An atom's position in a system is based upon its density in relation to the surrounding densities and the changes in magnetism, electricity, and temperature. Density is the most important function in determining the position of an object. Density is the vibration intensity within a volume in relation to the density of the surrounding medium. Density is the vibration intensity within a volume? What? What is that even supposed to mean? Like, density is just the amount of mass in a volume. That's all. Anyway, this is just one of these papers that is completely wrong because it doesn't actually understand what it is talking about. If it actually knew what it was talking about, then clearly the arguments would be better than that. But this is what we have, so. But anyway, that's it for this video. Leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like me to make future videos on. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons, Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Shaki, Wolfie, Mori, Graymore Coast, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell, and Militant Agnostic. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon, there should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.